Dr. Brakey, thank you so much for joining us on the Plant Trainers Podcast today. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate the opportunity. You're welcome. And you're sitting outside in your beautiful yard and we might hear some birds chirping. And I just love that outdoor feel. So thank you for bringing that to us. I'm grateful for that. Is there something that you're grateful for today? Oh, my gosh. Well, of course, days like this when I can work outside, but also this time of year in Michigan, a, a particularly awesome form of cantaloupe comes into season. Uh, I don't know if those who are on video can see it, but these these uh, Crenshaw melons come into season at the farmer's market. And oh, my gosh, it, it's like it's like candy. Uh, oh, um, <laughs> snack break. <laughs> so thankful for the ability to enjoy healthy plant based foods that are also super tasty. So um, it, it's great to have awesome foods, farmers markets, and this time of year in Michigan, and I'm sure across many of the areas where your listeners are, uh, these foods that bring, bring great pleasure to us are in season, it's awesome. Summertime is definitely an abundance of plant foods and to know that you can get them a little bit more local than you might be able to during the winter for us northern hemisphere people. Um, it, it's beautiful and that's definitely something to be grateful for. Were you always plant based and grateful for all of this abundance of fruit and vegetable or is this something that came later on in life for you? Oh, wow. No, when we were kids, uh, we ate horribly. Uh, my mom and dad uh, didn't know better. Uh, they taught us the standard American diet back in the 60s. And oh, wow, we had uh, Captain Crunch with whole milk. Uh, we had uh, uh, ham and cheese sandwiches and some kind of meat and dairy every day. Uh, I developed a severe form of hand eczema. Um, it was treated with stronger and stronger steroids. My brother had his tonsils out. Another one had uh, recurrent constipation. Uh, it, it was it was sad because later, uh, at age 21, when I was in medical school, I did some more research and started learning about the, the social, the environmental, and the health effects of the kind of diet we were on. Uh, switched at that point in 1977 to a plant-based lifestyle, um, and my eczema resolved. Uh, I never had felt terrible, but uh, I felt great. And now at uh, age 65, uh, 43 years later, um, I, I, I love rollerblading and uh, flyboarding. I love to ski fast and go scuba diving. Uh, all the things that life has to offer are still available for me because I have my health. And I attribute a good part of that uh, to my plant-based lifestyle for all these years. That is, you're probably one of the longest plant-based people we've had on the podcast. I mean, we hear people like 21 years and we're like, wow, we wish we had that. But yeah, 43 years, that's incredible. So how come you found this through your own research in medical school at the age of 21, 43 years ago? Why is it taking so long for the rest of the world to find this lifestyle and see all the benefits that you're noticing? Well, uh, you know, there are several reasons for that. Uh, one, of course, is just societal norms. It's co sort of normalized from an early age for people to uh, eat the way that um, we're, we're taught. Uh, and uh, it, that's passed on through the generations. Uh, so it seems different or, or odd, even though looking around the world and through human history, really the normal is a plant-based diet. Uh, but we've been socialized uh, against that. And then, of course, you have powerful forces, uh, industries from food to agribusiness to pharmacy to others who really don't want it to change. Uh, and they have gone on a um, campaign uh, to promote their products. You know, it's just it's not that they're evil. They're just uh, doing good business. Um, and it comes out as a misinformation campaign uh, using their lobbyists, uh, their influence uh, to... Um, sponsor studies that uh, are, are not well done uh, to confuse people uh, and so and in general people are fairly confused about that even though among unbiased experts there oh, no real controversy it's overwhelming evidence that a whole food plant-based diet helps people to optimize their health and prevent chronic disease um, general public is confused by these um, so-called experts uh, who 
um, put forth an opposite view or the latest fad, uh, the media doesn't help either because it would be boring if every time they came on, they just said, yeah, keep eating plant-based. Well, that doesn't sell a lot of Time magazines or Good Morning Americas. What sells is, oh, newsflash, butter is back or, oh, we had it wrong. You know, cholesterol doesn't matter anymore. Uh, and, you know, everybody's attracted to controversy to the Jack, Dr. McDougall says people love to read that what they love to eat is good for them. Um, controversy and, sexy. Yeah. 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 <laughs> for and we have cravings for those. We have built in cravings for fat, salt and sugar. So people want to hear that's it. Um, then you have our education system, everything from educating the population to our medical education that is centered around uh, the status quo. So, uh, yeah, I, I had hoped, you know, as I've dedicated much of my career to helping educate people on this, that we'd be further along now. But that said, I have never seen it like this. You know, in these last five years, uh, really, I think these last 10 years since Forks Over Knives came out, um, the interest, the growth, the number of people talking about it, the, the great podcasts like yours uh, that are truly educating people about the truth uh, uh, have come out in, 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 in waves. Uh, and now uh, this whole uh, viral pandemic is focusing greater attention to on well, where did that come from and what can we do to maintain health, enhance immunity, prevent the next pandemic? Well, it's all pointing towards uh, whole food, plant-based lifestyle as the best way to, to solve all of that. Uh, so uh, even though, again, the first uh, you know, 35 years was uh, pretty uh, paddling upstream, I find now that the, the interest the momentum uh, for this is growing at such a rate that I'm very optimistic these next 10 years will bring a sea change. This, this is amazing. And we have never seen, we have so many people coming on our, our live videos saying, I've been, you know, plant-based or trying to be as plant-based as possible for the last three weeks, four weeks. It's more and more and more people who are getting the message. And um, thank you for the work that you're doing. And I wanted the listeners who, who have been listening a while or even a short while, when we interviewed Dr. Melissa Sunderman, she was telling us about her her new position at, at the hospital or, or the clinic in, in Michigan. And she said, and I'm almost quoting. And when I was in the interview, the doctor leaned over the table and said, so what are your views on if you can reverse diabetes? And I was like, wow, somebody other than Esselstyn asked you that question. And so you are the doctor that asked Dr. Sunderman that question. So I just wanted to make that connection there. And we'll link back to that episode in, in the show notes at planttrainers.com for sure. And just recently, you were actually at the Peapod conference talking about kidney disease. Yes. And uh, it, is that a conference that you've participated in before? Yes, absolutely. I'm on the board for Peapod and uh, I've been uh, participating for these last four years. Uh, it's uh, a conference where we bring together national and international experts on plant-based prevention of disease uh, to talk about the prevention and, and reversal or treatment of chronic disease. Um, of course, commonly uh, the heart disease, um, uh, cancers, uh, hypertension, obesity are ones that commonly come up. Uh, but not so much about the kidneys. Uh, so we decided this year to include a segment uh, where I did the, uh, the keynote talk and we had uh, four panelists, including two nephrologists, uh, a food for life instructor and a, and a renal dietitian uh, joined me um, in our presentation. Um, and again, very well received. I think people uh, don't realize the, both the extent of chronic kidney disease and the importance of lifestyle and maintaining healthy kidneys throughout your life. It is quite important. And I think when people think of kidney, um, they think of kidney stones mm -hmm. and, you know, they think of dialysis or even maybe diabetes. So can you give the listeners a roundabout idea of what those chronic illnesses are and how they can really affect the body? Yes. Um, Let's back up a little step and talk about the kidneys. Um, these are two organs here in the middle of our back. Uh, the, the main job is to filter the blood uh, and they also maintain pH and electrolyte balance. They 
activate vitamin D and form other hormones that help in red cell uh, production uh, and uh, long-term blood pressure control. Uh, they work 24-7, filtering 150 quarts a day uh, to produce the one or two quarts of urine that we uh, push put out to uh, remove toxins from our body and do all those balancing. Uh, so uh, if they're not working well, uh, nobody else is doing well either, uh, and so uh, critically important. Um, at the microstructure, there are about 800,000 nephrons, or microscopic nephrons, in each of our kidneys that perform these heroic tasks uh, all the time. Um, and uh, these, um, uh, again, are critically important to the function of everything throughout the body. Um, so uh, chronic kidney disease then has become epidemic, affecting one in seven Americans now, and uh, one in three over age 65. So the incidence increases with age. Um, it's estimated now that because of the growth rate that half of all Americans now age 35 to 64 uh, will get chronic kidney disease at some point in their lifetime. Uh, I mean, again, talk about epidemic. You're talking about half of people. Uh, so uh, so we are, we're facing a, a great challenge with this. Um, and uh, uh, as you suggest, we want to get to the root cause of that and trying to figure out how we can uh, mitigate those uh, harmful effects. Um, tell me again a little uh, your your question because I think I. No, that's fine. Little, that's that's uh, a great explanation. So about ten years ago, I was told that I have a tumor on my kidney, and I was told that I needed it to be removed immediately. And for people that are in that kind of a situation. I was told that you could live with one kidney. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, we have an excess. Uh, we have a reserve of kidney function, uh, and uh, you certainly can survive. And sometimes people donate a kidney as part of a kidney transplant, uh, and, and do fine. So, uh, and that's why uh, you know it takes over time because even though the kidneys start to go down in function, uh, that reserve uh, serves us well, and it's not often until later. That it starts to get to a point um, that it, it can, can cause great challenge. Uh, I remember a little more about your question, though. You uh, alluded to diabetes and uh, hypertension. These are the two main, most common kind of risk factors for chronic kidney disease. Uh, diabetes accounting for about 44 percent uh, and uh, high, high blood pressure about another 25 percent, so almost three quarters from those two risk factors. Um, uh, not everybody with those gets chronic kidney disease, of course, but those uh, put an extra strain on the kidneys. Uh, and we'll come back to this, but that's twofold. It's both a common root cause, the same thing that puts a strain on the blood vessels causing hypertension, or the insulin resistance causing diabetes also is toxic to the kidneys, uh, but also those diseases create an environment where it's hard for the kidneys to do their function. Um, there's a, a group of other miscellaneous causes, and one of them, as you mentioned, is urologic causes or kidney stones. If there's a, a urinary tract blockage uh, and the kidney gets blocked or backed up, then that can cause acute kidney injury and, if not, uh, uh, if not uh, solved, uh, lead to chronic kidney disease as well. Um, and kidney stones are also largely preventable through uh, nutrition and lifestyle. Um, we can cover that if you want to also. <laughs> I, I want to get into how to attack or reverse or prevent some of these diseases, but what are some of the other big ones that are affecting people's quality of life or even lifespan? Oh, wow. You know, the, um, the chronic diseases I see every day in my office, uh, the, we talked about the two big ones, hypertension and diabetes, uh, hyperlipidemia or elevated cholesterol, which of course leads to our number one killer. Uh, coronary artery disease, uh, and then strokes. Um, we, in older folks, we see Alzheimer's, which actually starts much earlier in life, uh, can start 20 to 30 years earlier, uh, and that's becoming epidemic now as a result of our lifestyle. Um, we, we see um, cancers, uh, especially uh, colon, prostate, and breast uh, cancers uh, at, at huge rates, the second leading cause of death in the United States is cancers, uh, many of which are also preventable um, with uh, lifestyle metrics. Um, and and in, then, in terms of the kidney diseases, which are the bigger ones that people are seeing? Which are the most frequent? Yeah, the, the 
chronic kidney disease is the most frequent, uh, affecting again at uh, one in seven. Uh, but kidney stones are also an increasing um, incidence. Uh, it used to affect one in 20, and now one in 11, just in 20 years. Uh, so the high protein, uh, animal protein in particular, is the main risk for, for kidney stones. Um, there's also polycystic kidney disease. There are other uh, forms um, that uh, can uh, can cause kidney failure. But yeah, definitely CKD and uh, stones are the two biggest. And what are the stones? Are they actually calcification that that are making little stone type things within the kidneys? Yeah, that's right. They're literally stones. Uh, they've made uh, the vast majority of them are calcium oxalate stones. They may have a uric acid nidus or core and then around that, just like that crystal experiment you did in fourth grade with the saturated sugar solution, they crystallize out with calcium and oxalate uh, around that, and they can form stones as small as, uh, you know, microscopic and, and as large as a uh, half an inch, um, and uh, or, or even larger. You get what's called a staghorn calculus that fills most of the pelvis of the kidney, um, and these uh, stones then can block the ureter, the drainage from the kidney, and cause severe pain. Uh, some of the patients in the most pain I've seen have uh, been in the middle of a kidney stone episode. Um, so yes, uh, these uh, these stones are uh, also quite common. My dad was a urologist, uh, so I remember around the dinner table as kids, or he'd take us on rounds in the hospital, seeing people with the effects of uh, kidney stone disease. Um, and uh, again, unfortunately common, but fortunately also largely preventable. So you mentioned one of the reasons that people get the stones is because of excess animal protein. Is, is there's also talk about it being due to over calcium overconsumption of calcium through the oxalates in the spinach or the almonds or things like that but then there's also talk about dehydration being a cause of that is that truth or is there other reasons there are, are kernels in each of those um, dehydration can be obviously the more concentrated the solution uh, <clears throat> The, the more likely it is to crystallize out. So uh, eating plenty of water foods, uh, fruits and vegetables, uh, hydrated uh, beans and grains, and drinking enough water are important parts of that also. Um, and uh, it's not so much a calcium excess, though. We, we used to think, hey, calcium is the main component, so don't eat too much calcium. And uh, certainly dairy is a double whammy because the animal protein and the excess calcium uh, but uh, it's not so much a calcium excess disease uh, as it is that the animal protein, when you increase animal protein um, uh, by uh, double your animal protein intake, your calcium excretion goes up by 50% in the urine. It forces an increased calcium uh, a loss in the urine. Uh, so that's what increases the environment for kidney stones mainly. You mentioned oxalates um, and certain um, of the green leafy vegetables, especially spinach, are very high in oxalates. So people who do have a history of kidney stones or recurrent kidney stones should uh, manage or moderate their intake of uh, spinach. Uh, other green leafy, so like kale, are no problem. Um, and uh, in general, though, um, the main root cause is animal protein. So if someone were to have a history of kidney stones and not obviously want it to recur because I've heard it's almost as painful as childbirth. Um, <laughs> so if, if that's the case, if they choose to continue to eat animal products, then they should be limiting the amount of spinach or almonds and, and those types of foods. But do you think that or have you seen situations where people have given up animal products and have been able to consume regular moderate amounts of almonds and spinach and then not had a recurring problem? I think that's a good point. If you're not eating the animal proteins, your risks are already much lower and you can afford more oxalate containing vegetables. Uh, and uh, if you're still eating animal foods, then you do have to be even more careful. Uh, but but I'd emphasize that the oxalates are a smaller component compared to the proteins. Mm -hmm. uh, if uh, you, you can't expect to say, well, I'm just going to 
you know, eat chicken three times a week, uh, and therefore I'll be able to eat more spinach. Um, the, the, the less the better. If you really don't want to get kidney stones again, um, ditch the animal protein in all forms. That includes especially the higher protein ones, uh, like uh, egg whites, uh, the uh, chicken and fish uh, that people commonly think of as healthy. Can you... Thank you. And and I think that's a really important message for people to hear from all aspects if they have given up animal products since um, their diagnosis to be able to say, OK, I can eat some more of those foods. However, if you could eat the kale and you could eat so many other leafy greens, you can live life completely healthy without having without having that's spinach. Right. Yeah, um, <laughs> absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Can you explain to us a little bit about dialysis and the idea also of hydration? And a lot of people on dialysis will limit their water because their kidneys aren't functioning properly and it can cause problems, but hydration is so important. So help us understand how to properly navigate this situation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Again, let's back up a little step as your, uh, your kidney function usually uh, we measure it and it's called your EGFR, the glomerular filtration rate. And uh, normal is over 60. Uh, as people start down a path of, of injuring their kidneys with uh, inflammation, acid, uh, mainly animal food diets, it drops down to chronic kidney disease uh, at stage 30 to, to 60. Uh, that's called stage 3 CKD. Uh, stage four um, ends up less than 30. And then when you start getting down to uh, 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 EGFR of um, between 10 and 15, you're getting in towards end stage kidney disease. Um, and if it drops down to that level for long, uh, for uh, more than just transient, um, you end up with uh, three choices. That's your kidneys are failing, uh, dialysis, uh, kidney transplant, or morgue. Um, and uh, none of the three are really very uh, helpful. Um, the immediate kind of stopgap measure for people in that situation is dialysis, which is an artificial kidney machine. Uh, it's where the blood is literally pumped out from the um, uh, system into the machine where it's filtered in an artificial way and then put back into the body. And people commonly have to do this uh, three or more times a week or is what's called peritoneal dialysis, where it goes into the space within the abdomen and then flushes back out. Um, people spend uh, uh, several hours a week uh, on these kidney machines, uh, and uh, they cannot um, they cannot do the job like your kidneys did. Uh, again, it keeps people going, uh, but 20% of all people on dialysis uh, die each year. Um, it's uh, it's not an easy life, and it's uh, not a great prognosis. So uh, I want to emphasize the importance of preventing getting to that stage. <laughs> Chronic kidney disease in its earliest stages may be uh, reversible, but uh, when you get to that stage, um, that's what you need. Uh, now, for your question, uh, if you're on dialysis, uh, yes, you need to use, limit your fluid intake, your, your cal you need to carefully watch potassium and phosphorus. You need to be under the care of a, a renal dietitian and a dialysis uh, team that includes a nephrologist. And uh, you need to, to follow carefully those things. Uh, the, the, you're right, the um, cravings for, for fluid become there, but you, since your kidneys can't take out the extra water if you drink it, you have to carefully monitor how much you're you're taking in. Um, it's it's part of the process, just like people with uh, certain diseases have to carefully monitor or give themselves injections. People on dialysis have to carefully follow a routine uh, to uh, keep themselves in balance. So if you mentioned that you need to avoid foods that are high in potassium and phosphorus, I mean, I know bananas have been marketed as the potassium food when there's so many other foods that are higher in potassium, but that's a significant amount of plant foods. So you have somebody who's got kidney failure and they're told to avoid potassium and phosphorus. So they give up those foods and therefore eat more meat, which is then creating a bigger problem. Is that what we're seeing? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, the 
we used to uh, say that, and still many uh, folks believe that sense that you need to be so careful about those. But even people in stage four chronic kidney disease with some uh, good planning should still eat plenty of fruits and vegetables. Uh, and uh, let's talk about potassium first. Um, and again, backing up a step, our kidneys are responsible for acid-base balance. Um, and if you um, eat more foods that have an acid uh, um, um, kind of ash to them, uh, and this comes from the animal protein and the sulfur amino acids that are in those, cysteine and methionine, uh, the highest of all is fish. Uh, also, pork and poultry are very high in these sulfur-containing amino acids. So this acid environment forces the kidneys and puts a strain on the kidneys uh, to... to uh, uh, try to to do their job. Um, uh, instead, if you're on a plant-based diet, the alkaline environment helps your kidneys to function better, prevent decline, and better handle potassium. Um, so your kidneys are more able to manage the potassium even in the um, later stages of uh, chronic kidney disease if you're not eating the animal protein. So do you see what I mean? A lot of the dietitians still have people eating the meat, which creates the environment where the potassium goes up, and then, oh, don't eat the potassium, instead of getting to the root cause. It's a common misunderstanding. Uh, you do need to monitor, measure potassium, uh, and in some cases, moderate or limit those foods, uh, but to eliminate them or switch to meat is counterproductive. In fact, potassium intake is correlated with longevity and a decreased incidence of chronic kidney disease. Uh, if you take general population, those with the highest potassium increase have a 44% less lower risk of going on to chronic kidney disease. So it, people um, in general and even those in stage 3 CKD eat lots of potassium foods and cut out the animal foods to help that concern. Once you get to stage four, uh, work with a qualified renal dietitian to make sure you're monitoring it. Um, and, uh, and then let's talk about phosphorus. It turns out that the uh, phosphorus in animal foods um, is much more easily absorbed than those from plant-based foods, which are in the form of phytates. Uh, since we don't have the enzyme phytase to digest it, you may only have 30 to 40% of phosphorus absorbed from plant foods whereas 60 to 80% from animal foods. Um, in addition, they commonly inject uh, animal foods because of preservative with phosphates uh, and the three to 500 milligrams per serving, and this further adds to it. Uh, so, um, and then uh, of course, phosphates in preserved foods and soda pops, even diet soda are horrible. They're very quickly 100% absorbed. Uh, and so cutting out the fast food, uh, junk foods, uh, sodas, um, and uh, animal foods actually helps for phosphate too. Uh, in one study of people with uh, uh, late-stage chronic kidney disease 3 with an AGFR of 32, they did a crossover study, two weeks of vegetarian versus two weeks of regular diet, and those on the vegetarian diet had lower phosphate levels. Um, so this whole myth that, oh, you need to go back and eat more meat to prevent your phosphorus problem uh, is a challenge. Once again, you get into late stages of four or five, uh, you do have to be more careful because the normal function of the kidneys isn't there. You know, work with a qualified uh, renal dietitian to manage that. But yes, potassium phosphorus are uh, overblown and again, commonly even by uh, many in the medical profession, used as an excuse to get people away from the very diet whole food plant-based diet that would help prevent progression. It almost feels like the conversation about having osteoporosis and you need to take in more dairy to get your calcium when we've learned that the calcium is being withdrawn from the bones to be able to balance the pH level of the blood. So it puts it into a vicious circle. So it just reminded me of that situation. Absolutely. Dairy correlates, higher dairy correlates with higher osteoporosis. Right. I was in the grocery store the other day, and I mean, when, when we get feedback from people who have worked with us, for people who have, you know, done coaching with us, or even just come to our lives, the feedback that we get is that we're extremely sensitive to where people are in their journeys, and that we don't, um, we, that that we take them we take them on their journey where they're ready to go when they're ready to go and that they never feel judged by us 
But I do yeah. find that walking into the grocery store lately, even more so than meat in the cart, because I understand why people don't know as much as they know. But I, but the pop, the soda pop, the the soft drinks that are in the carts, and these people who are their whole cart was filled with soda, and I'm like, please tell me that they're having some kind of party. I mean, I still wouldn't serve it at my party, but you know, please tell me that they're having some kind of party. And I'm starting to get to the point where I can't hold back. The same way you kind of the things you think when you see someone smoking, we sh we should know better with the pop. It's we should know better, and I don't think that people understand the severity of what is happening to their body every time they take a sip. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. You, you want to uh, allow people to take their journey and, and make their progress as they do. And at the same time, especially when it's people you may know or care about, you see them doing things that you know is hard and you have to kind of wait for them to ask yeah. <laughs> because the worst thing to do is to uh, start... Um, uh, a confrontation which ends up to be counterproductive. So good good for you for recognizing the importance of um, helping people when they're ready. So we've been talking about chronic kidney disease, but how do people know if they have it? Are there certain signs or certain symptoms that people would be would have that would show their them or their doctor that they have chronic kidney, kidney disease? Wow, that's that's a big part of the challenge here in the early stages. It's totally asymptomatic. Uh, you wouldn't know. Uh, you don't see it in your urine. Uh, you don't uh, feel any different at first. Uh, in fact, some people come with late stage kidney disease and their only symptom is fatigue. Uh, so um, the, the first thing is to recognize, as I mentioned, that the vast majority come along with other chronic disease, especially diabetes and hypertension. Uh, and if you have those conditions, you should follow with your with your physician, or hopefully you have a primary care physician uh, who will intermittently measure your blood blood test. Uh, and that's it's, it's an easy blood test uh, to tell if, you, if you're in the early stages of it. Uh, and the thing I would coach people too is that um, that EGFR test is, is reported on uh, common basic metabolic panels. Uh, and if your doctor doesn't start a conversation, if it starts getting down close to 60 or in the, in the upper 50s, um, you know, open it up. Because oftentimes doctors are so used to that just being common. Oh, when people get to be 60 years old, it just always goes into the 50s, so they don't even mention it. No, that's a teachable moment. As soon as it gets to 59, I sit people down and say, you now have chronic kidney disease stage three. Uh, you don't want to end up on dialysis. And they're like, wait, what? I said, no, don't get me wrong. You're far from that. Uh, but if this continues, uh, I just, you know, I've seen this. Uh, and one of my patients in particular went into the 50s and 40s. and I kept talking with him. Yeah, I'll get to it. Eventually got down to 30 and then 12. Uh, and I said, that you got to head over and get on dialysis. He says, no, doc, I'll eat whatever you want. You know, I'll, I, I said, you know what, it's too late. Um, and so it's it's imminently preventable and, and if you reach it in those early stages. Uh, in fact, in one study, they took type 1 diabetics who had a, a, you could see the rapid decline over the prior two years in their kidney function, put them on a plant-based diet, and it leveled out um, uh, pretty much all of the uh, the uh, 12 p it's a small study, but 12 people in the study over the following two years leveled out their kidney function. So it's possible at most stages, in most situations, you never say always, um, to arrest this uh, decline. Um, so that's my question to you. You said it's too late and you're saying arresting the decline. Does that mean that we can stop further deterioration, but we cannot reverse and we cannot get better than 50 or 60 once we're at 50 or 60? Um, you know, that that's a good question. There's, there's, uh, there's two parts to it. Uh, we now understand that diseases like diabetes, uh, obesity, and hypertension are reversible. They're, they're not really diseases at all. They're metabolic imbalance conditions caused by wrong food. Uh, when you give a human organism food, it was never intended. Uh, metabolic imbalances happen. And if you start feeding right again, those can reverse. Um, chronic kidney disease, though, is more like uh, chronic lung disease in smokers. Um, after a while, those uh, alveoli in the lungs start to 
break down and open out from years of abuse of smoking and people get emphysema that's not reversible. The same thing here, nephrons in the kidneys are resilient but not indestructible. And when you eat animal fat that clogs the arteries, animal protein that induces what's called hyperfiltration and makes the kidneys rev up 30 to 40 percent uh, just to process that animal protein. Uh, see, carnivores have kidneys that are three times their size per body weight than we do. They're designed for this. Our kidneys aren't designed for that. Um, the pro-inflammatory components from heme iron and uh, TMAO uh, from arachidonic acid in animal foods puts such a strain on the kidneys that those lit nephrons literally start to die out. Now, as some start to die, the, the blood flow is, is first shunted toward the other ones, and they can help pick up the slack for a while. But this process continues over and over, uh, and, and as such, they're, they're uh, on a downward path. So in general, uh, we think of chronic kidney disease as arrestable through good diet, but not uh, reversible. The exceptions to that would, would be uh, a couple fold, is that acute kidney injury is reversible. Uh, and that can come from uh, pre-renal or post-renal, that, that can come from a variety of causes. And that's a sudden drop in kidney function, which can come back. And sometimes people confuse that. Wow, I went way down in my kidney function and, it, and, I, and I reversed it. That's acute kidney injury. Uh, chronic kidney disease is a slow, gradual decline. And, and I have several times seen in the early stages reversal because people do change in time enough while those ones are still kind of resilient enough to, to, to not not be fully damaged or lost. So I, I have commonly seen people go into the 50s. Um, they change their diet, they reverse their diabetes or hypertension, and it comes back up to the 60s or even 70s. So yes, in that case, in the early stages. Uh, and there are occasional times where people get down even lower and improve it uh, uh, with, with their uh, kidney function. Uh, because let's face it, getting rid of the root cause environment uh, it can do nothing but, but good uh, for the kidneys. Uh, but I do think we have to be careful about giving people false hope and saying, hey, you know, when it gets down to where they start to talk about dialysis, just do this and it'll go away. Um, it, it, you've got to focus on prevention. Unfortunately, people wait till it's too late to really make changes. And that's one of the things that we're all trying to do is trying to get people to make change before they absolutely have to make the changes. I, yeah. I work with a lot of women who have stress, anxiety, fatigue, maybe adrenal issues, maybe cortisol issues. And the adrenals are very closely knit to the kidneys, of course. And I think that doctors, at least in, I feel like in the States, doctors do every test imaginable because they want to make sure that they're covered from, from all kinds of things that can happen. In Canada, they are much more cautious and they need to have proof that they're doing a specific test and spending money on a specific test for good reason. So as people get older, of course, they're you know, of course, people expect, oh, well, I'm 60 years old, I'm seven years old, of course, I have kidney failure or, or something like that. But should, should younger people who maybe have healthier lifestyles now, but are still experiencing chronic fatigue issues, get their kidney function tested and make sure that their doctor does that if it's not part of their regular labs? They should. Yes, uh, again, especially if they have uh, high blood pressure or diabetes, but even in general, uh, it's uh, it's good. Uh, again, you don't have to overdo it and depending how you're feeling and, and partly what your lifestyle is. Uh, if you're whole food plant-based, um, you know, probably every five years for a screening test is good enough if your results are good. Um, but if people continue to choose to, to eat the uh, standard American or standard Canadian diet, uh, they should be more cautious and make sure that it, it is checked. That's a good point. So for our listeners, our viewers, what can they do to ensure that they're keeping their kidneys at their healthiest point? Are there certain things that people should be focusing on? Yes, yeah, several things. Um, the A number one is the diet. Uh, as I mentioned, it's not only the animal fat, which clogs the uh, arteries uh, heading to the kidneys and compromises them and cholesterol, uh, but the animal protein 
uh, which increases hyperfiltration, creates inflammation, uh, is an acid um, uh, kind of a, a kidney uh, assault. Uh, they have to form ammonia in the process to help counter that, and over time that leads to uh, kidney toxicity. Uh, and then a, a other compounds called advanced glycation end products, which occur when uh, meats are cooked at temperatures above 212. Uh, grilling, baking, frying result in these um, advanced glycation end products and heterocyclic amines, which are toxic all over the body, but the kidneys being especially sensitive. So A number one is move away from the animal and processed foods to a uh, whole food plant-based lifestyle to best preserve kidney function. Uh, number two is to limit or eliminate non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medicines, uh, Motrin, Aleve, Ibuprofen, aspirin uh, taken over a regular time. I'm not saying now and then if you get a backache and you need to take a Motrin, don't be afraid of that. But over time or higher doses um, can be uh, especially hard uh, on, on the kidneys. Uh, and uh, you know, as Shoshana mentioned, uh, drinking enough water. Uh, if you're eating high water containing foods, you don't have to be as um, uh, concerned about that, but stay hydrated, uh, drink whenever thirsty, especially if you're working out uh, to make sure you stay hydrated. Um, I used to tell my kids when you get up in the morning, get, take a drink of water to give your kidneys something to work with because uh, overnight you're, you're making urine, but you're not drinking and you want to stay hydrated enough uh, to give your kidneys something to work with. Uh, and then importantly too, avoid those chronic diseases. Put additional assault on your kidneys. Diabetes, hypertension, the two biggest ones are almost entirely preventable and commonly reversible uh, even, even when you have them uh, through uh, the same uh, whole food plant-based lifestyle that helps prevent the kidneys. So yeah, the, it's, it's, it's really pretty straightforward and it's pretty cool too that the same diet that helps prevent heart disease and prostate and breast cancer and Alzheimer's uh, and gallstones and appendicitis and acne and all this also helps prevent chronic kidney disease. It's, it's, it's the same thing. You feed the organism right and it does well by you. Um, one other point, because you got me started, um, is fiber. Uh, Fiber is critical nutrient. 97% uh, of Americans and probably about as many Canadians are fiber deficient in their diet. And uh, the average American is only 15 grams a day. Uh, and that 97% is the 30 gram level, which they, is our minimum recommended amount. Even that is excessively low compared to what we really need. If you look at areas of the world where fiber intake is, is robust, you're talking 60 to 100 or more grams a day, which is really normal human that our ancestors evolved on. And, and this is critically important for your kidneys too, because that feeds your microbiome. Uh, I'm sure you've had other guests on talk about this because it's, it's, it's all um, increasingly recognized as, as critically important. And if you feed them right with fruits, vegetables, whole grains and beans and the fiber residue that goes through to, to um, encourage diversity and healthy microbiome, they, they detoxify, they produce nutrients, they're anti-inflammatory, they help manage hormones and all of these uh, effects support kidney health. In contrast, if you feed them chicken and cheese and eggs and potato chips, pop tarts and ice cream, um, they don't do very well and they do the opposite. They produce inflammation, they increase estrogen reabsorption, they create toxins, uh, they uh, create gap junctions in the colon and set us up for autoimmune disease. So we can't uh, talk about kidney health without also talking about fiber. Uh, everybody thinks of it as, hey, that supports your colon health and it might help other things, but it really helps every organ of the body, including the, the kidney. So fiber in every bite. Fiber in every bite. I love that. And yes, we have had so many guests on lately that <laughs> fiber in your cantaloupe um, that have been talking about that. And it is true that whatever, usually whatever it is that we're trying to conquer in the body, it is the same nutritional prescription more or less so that is huge we want to thank you so much for taking the time with us today to talk about kidney disease it is so prevalent but not usually talked about so i think that this is a very important conversation that we had very important conversation or for the listeners and viewers to chain to to share i should say and if somebody would like to learn more about you or where you work 
uh, where would you like them to go? Well, um, you know, I, I, um, work in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I've been in family medicine, lifestyle family medicine for 35 years now. Um, my, my uh, practice is closed. I'm not looking for new business. I mean, to new patients. Uh, but uh, uh, but uh, you can go to our practice website, ihacares.com. Uh, my my uh, group is getting more into lifestyle medicine. And, uh, I just started as the medical director, the first medical director for our Lifestyle Medicine Institute. So we'll be... Uh, um, putting up more on our website about resources and information for our over 500,000 patients in Southeast Michigan, and uh, uh, and others are welcome to uh, look in on that too. Um, the, some of the other groups I'm involved with uh, are even more focused on uh, lifestyle and plant-based nutrition, uh, and these these come to that how-to question because a lot of people get information for your podcast and they go, okay, I got it, but how? I'm not used to this, and Two groups. One you mentioned already, PPOD, uh, p-pod.org, uh, is a great educational group that uh, caters mostly to health professionals, uh, dietitians, nurses, and physicians, with an annual conference. We just completed it last weekend, as you mentioned, and the next one coming in May will actually be uh, a double conference, uh, one in Raleigh uh, in North Carolina, one here in uh, uh, Ypsilanti, Michigan, uh, hopefully live if COVID allows it by then, but also a virtual option. So anybody from anywhere will be able to attend either of those. And again, top experts from uh, around the country, many of whom you've interviewed, uh, will be speaking at that Peapod conference. Um, and uh, so that's a great resource for learning and education. And then for everyday support, and especially for people in the community, um, Plant-Based Nutrition Support Group, uh, pbnsg.org, uh, founded by Paul Chatlin, who reversed his heart disease uh, and went on to, we've got over 7,000 members now from around the world uh, and spreading to small groups uh, around the country and Canada uh, to uh, help people with um, education, uh, cooking classes, uh, information sessions, uh, uh, now virtual talks. Um, every month we have a small groups virtual meeting. Um, usually I'm uh, involved in that. We answer questions and assist people with practical advice like, uh, what do I do when I go out to dinner? How do I go over to a friend's house to eat? Uh, what do I shop for? How do I make quinoa? Uh, all of these things that are important parts on the how-to. So uh, those are uh, three resources. Um, if you like, I can s send you my Dr. Bob's Eight Keys for Health and Success, which has a lot more resources. If you have a way of posting or sharing that with your, your group, uh, I'm glad to share that with you. And it has a lot of other resources, including uh, documentaries to watch, websites, uh, books, and info uh, that will help people to um, advance as, as far as they want or as far as they're ready for on this journey to health and vitality. Dr. Brakey, it's amazing information. Thank you so much for sharing all of this with us and our listeners. We really appreciate your time and for joining us on the Plant Trainers Podcast. Oh, thank you for all your work. Uh, you're doing a great job of helping people to see how you can improve your athletic performance, your overall health, your longevity. Uh, and I, I so appreciate uh, I mean, partners in this movement uh, like you too. Um, thank you for having me today as well. And uh, let me know if I can assist at any point in the future. Thank, Thank you. you.